podcast is part of the Sports Social Podcast Network. Hello and welcome to a new podcast, The Paddock and the Pavilion with Stephen Wallace. In each show, Stephen will interview someone connected to the world of horse racing or cricket. Hi there. By the time most of you are listening to today's podcast, British summertime will have arrived. The cricket season is about to start and the turf flat season is now underway. Congratulations also to Richard Friedman, our guest on episode 16, for training the winner of the prestigious Golden Slipper race with his brother Michael at Rose Hill in Sydney on Saturday morning. Today's guest is a man of many talents. Philip Blacker was a former National Hunt jockey who in a 14-year career rode 340 winners and nearly won the Grand National in 1981. After retiring from the saddle, he continued his development as a sculptor and he is now world famous in his second career. He is best known for his life-size or over-life-size horses which can be seen worldwide and is considered as one of the most important names in sporting art. Wherever you are today, sit back, relax and enjoy the soothing words of Philip Blacker. Hello Philip, delighted to welcome you to the Paddock and the Pavilion podcast. Hello Stephen, I'm delighted to be here. Well, how are you? Very well, I'm, I'm in great form. Uh, I can't wait for this lockdown to end, but um, apart from that, uh, I'm in terrific order. Well, were you busy watching Cheltenham last week? Or? I watched a bit of it. Uh, I have to admit, not all, but uh, because uh, I felt rather guilty sitting in front of the TV in the afternoon, even during Cheltenham week. Uh, in the old days, I never used to worry about that sort of thing. But now, now that uh, uh, I have to work hard on my sculpture, I, get, I have feelings of guilt when I sit in front of the TV in the daytime. Right. Well, today we're going to talk about your two careers. Most people only have one. Firstly, as a professional jump jockey, and your current profession as a world famous, well, I say equestrian sculptor, but it's it's gone beyond that now. How has the lockdown affected your sculpture work? Well, uh, it hasn't affected the work that I've been doing because I work at home anyway. So I'm used to it doesn't bother me at all um my wife's at home which is unusual because she she's a teacher and so she, she's uh, normally at some college in 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 swindon and um anyway so it it has not really affected that sales wise it's affected a bit because my main gallery is uh closed as you can imagine and will not be opening till i think april uh, in which case, in which case, the, the gallery owner keeps telling me, don't worry, there's going to be a boom. There's going to be a mad rush for, 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 to, for people to buy my work, which um, would be very exciting if it happens. But uh, sales have been steady, is all I can say, over the, over the, over the lockdown period. Well, let's hope you get that uh, bounce um, from April. But uh, to start with, if we can go back to your childhood, it's a long while ago, but uh, as your father was uh, an amateur jockey and an international show jumper, was horse racing always going to be in your blood? Yes, it was. I rode ponies. My dad was in the, in the army and he, he rose to become a very senior military officer. But when I was young, he was not so senior. And um, I used to ride ponies and did all sorts of show jumping, that sort of thing. But the one thing I wanted to be all my young life was to be a jockey. And there was, there was nothing else that uh, I wanted to do. And I used to watch uh, people like Fred Winter and Tim Brookshaw and uh, sort of think about the day when hopefully I would be one of them. Oh, so you're obviously steeped in racing then. Um, yeah, yes, yeah, absolutely. My dad rode as an amateur, as you said, um, and he rode in the Grand National. I think he hit the deck and uh, he won the Grand Military. But uh, I always wanted to be a professional. And um, the thing is that when I was 
about 15 or 16, I was very small. And uh, people used to say to me, you know, you ought to be a jockey. And unfortunately, by the time I became one, when I was 18, I was about five foot ten. So um, that was um, that was a bit disappointing because I thought I was going to be too tall. Yeah, that's, that's quite tall for, for a jockey. Now, just going back a fraction about your dad, I, I looked up, he, he rode in the 1948 Grand National and won the Grand Military Gold Cup at Sandown in 1954. He also won an MC in the Second World War. Yes, he did. Um, and I recently read an account of it. Uh, it sounded as though he was very brave. A lot braver than I certainly would have been, I'm sure. But uh, I think he had a pretty good war, as they say. Well, you were certainly brave um, riding in the 1970s. And your first winner was on a horse trained by your dad. Is that right, in 1968? It wasn't actually trained by him. Uh, he was the horse was actually originally owned by Chris Collins, who was a very successful amateur rider in those days, and I think he sold him to my dad, and he was trained by Brian Marshall, who was a a, a very successful jump jockey, Grand National winner, wasn't he? Yeah, yeah, he was, yeah, yeah, and um, very successful uh, jump jockey, a, a sort of rather less successful trainer. But he trained Abaddonian, this horse I rode uh, at Windsor, which won by a, a short head, if I remember rightly, beating Ali Bramford. It must have been special, though, um, having a connection with your dad, with your first winner. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, it was great. I mean, I was, I was incredibly lucky because um, he wanted to give me a leg up and um, he bought this horse, Abaddonian, who was a, he was a selling chaser. He wasn't anything, anything special. I mean, you know, he was a... He was a, a sort of selling chaser specialist and um, he used to win win his share of races and he was my first winner, so I was very lucky like that. Well, you, you've all got to start from somewhere and uh, you turned professional at the beginning of the 69-70 season and it didn't take long for you to have a ride in the Grand National in 1971, 50 years ago. Um, God, was it really? Uh, 1971, you came uh, seventh. Actually, I always thought I was a bit unlucky. Was that, I think that was well to do's year, wasn't it? Wasn't it the year? No, specify. 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 Yeah. Right. Uh, okay. I got that one wrong. Um, yeah, I rode a horse called Vichy Soise, who was trained by a man called Major Verley Buick, who I was riding for at the time. And he was a bit of a character. Um, and. Anyway, I rode Vichy Suarez, who was the most gutless horse that's ever been. I mean, how, I, I remember the race before the National. We went to Ludlow, which is probably the smallest fences in the country. And he tried to refuse. So I thought, well, that doesn't bode too well for Aintree. Anyway, for some extraordinary reason, when we, when we uh, ran at Aintree, he, um, he sort of took to these big fences. I just, I, and uh, by the time we got to the chair, which was... Uh, nearly a circuit i started to think well hang on a minute we're going rather well here you know what you know maybe we've got a chance but unfortunately a horse uh, as we got to the chair a horse fell in front of us and impeded vichy soise badly which wouldn't have mattered too much if he'd had a bit more courage but i think he thought well i've had enough of that anyway from then on we were struggling but we did str struggle to fin we did finish seventh, which was good. But I always thought that uh, had luck been on our side, we could have been well, not maybe probably not one, but we might have been placed. Well, it was a good good start to your Grand National career, and uh, it was only two years later when you featured in one of the most famous Grand Nationals of all, when Red Rum beat Crisp, and you're riding. Spanish steps carrying 11 stone 13 to come fourth. Yes, I, I was, although I was fourth, I was very disappointed because I was convinced we were going to win. And uh, because Spanish steps had a lot of class, although he wasn't quite as good as he had been a couple of years before, but he was still a very classy horse. And I thought, well, I know he's got a lot of weight, but... I thought he would probably he, he he could well win it, and 
It was one of those races where, from the word go, we were off the bridle. I mean, it's unusual. I mean, it doesn't happen in the national. You usually you just sit and hunt round for the first circuit, and then put the horse in the race. And half a mile from home, you start to to really race in earnest. But on this occasion, we jumped out the gate, and I was never on the bridle from the word go. Crisp and Grace Ombrero horse that uh, Bill Sh- Schumacher uh, was riding. Crisp was ridden by. Richard Pittman, and they just gone, uh, and we were struggling the whole way. And eventually, everything else dropped out except for. I remember going down to the to Beaches for the second time, and by that time, Gray Sombrero had fallen at the chair, and Crisp was probably still a fence in front, and we went down to the chair, and everything other than myself and red rum as i subsequently found out it was red rum but i didn't know at the time were we were the only ones pursuing him in earnest everyone else had sort of just dropped out because of the the, the furious pace and uh anyway all, i remember dry, going down to beaches for the second time and there's this this horse loomed up besides me and it was brian fletcher on red rum and eventually he started to pull away from us. And the rest is history. As we know, he got up and won. Yeah, it's all Richard's fault, isn't it? So, uh... <laughs> Richard's always very hard on himself uh, about that. But I thought he gave the horse a fantastic ride. Um, and uh, old Richard, he, you know, he sort, of, he, he, he sort of punished himself ever since. Uh, because every the trouble is everybody mentions it. I I made the mistake when he came to to lunch uh, some months ago before the lockdown. Somehow it came up, and he just looked at me daggers, and he said, "Oh, for God's sake, don't bring that up." <laughs> and uh, so um, I made myself unpopular with that one. Well, the national you came seventh again in in uh, 1977, which was Red Rum's third third win and then fourth in 1980 and then in 1981 you uh jumped the last upside some um, bob champion on Aldeniti. did you think you were going to win that day i said this is on royal mail yeah he was a wonderful horse royal mail my favorite ever horse i loved him in fact uh i was very lucky because when he retired a couple of years after i retired the owners gave him to me and i and he i had many happy years riding him at home and and um anyway yeah he ran in the national and stan meller who trained him who was a lovely man uh he but he and i always slightly disagreed about royal mail because he thought he stayed well and i said he was basically a two and a half my life there was a at that time, there was no two and a half mile chase at Cheltenham, and there is now. But at that time, if he if there had been a two and a half mile uh, championship chase at Cheltenham, he'd have won it. But anyway, he he was second in the Gold Cup, a bit of a lucky second in the Gold Cup, and then he ran in the national. And I thought I thought he wouldn't get the trip. To be perfectly honest, uh, but. What the great great thing about the, the the curious thing about the national is that because they go that much slower because it's a long race and the fences are bigger, especially in those days, those fences were bigger than they are now. But um, because of big fences and it's a four and a half mile race, you know, you tend to go not so fast as you would on a normal three mile chase. It used to uh, jump very low, and he had a very sort of flat way of jumping, and I didn't think wasn't sure that, that was going to suit him to suit us uh, round Aintree, but he's, he was brilliant. He just jumped round there like it was like it was sort of they were hurdles, and he was absolutely. And we went down to Beecher's second time, and I was sitting in behind, and I thought oh, I could win this. And Bob was out in front, Bob Champion. And the thing about Aldeniti was that he he started he. As, as we turn towards, after the canal turn, we turn towards Valentine's, and he starts, and he started to run left-handed, and Bob would pull him out to the middle of the track, and then he'd run left-handed down the fence. And 
I was on the inside and I pulled out a bit so that this I didn't get blinded by Aldeniti who was running left and um, anyway we were sitting in behind him and going to the second last we were I wouldn't say we were on the bridle but we were had a little bit left in the tank but I wasn't uh, I, I wasn't quite sure how much but we had a bit left and uh, anyway as I say Aldeniti ran left again as he did as he had done before and my horse it, it, it sort of unsighted him uh, and he made a bad mistake, a really bad mistake the second last. I mean, he was lucky to stand up. And um, as I sort of picked him up, I think I, it was my fault, really. I should have just sort of picked him up and sat and waited and just get allowed the horse to get his breath back and get his, get his uh, uh, equilibrium back and then had a go after the last. But I sort of slightly panicked and I picked him up and chased him. And... Um, by the time we got to the last, we were pretty well upsized with Bob. And, um, but that effort, had, that mistake and that effort had just um, done the horse in. It just found the last of his stamina. I always wonder what would have happened if, um, if he'd jumped the second last well and we'd been able to sit for that much longer. Uh, but he just, he just completely emptied out on the run-in and, and then got passed by, um, by Spartan Missile. But we were only beaten about five lengths, so it was, you know, it was a good effort by the horse. Were you certainly featured in the Grand Nationals that you completed in, in very sort of iconic races, what with the Red Rum first win, the Red Rum third win, and um, Bob Champion's tear-jerking 1981 win. But if we can just move to Cheltenham now, and you said that um, Royal Mail... Uh, finished second in the Gold Cup in 1979. You also, in that same year, won two of the major races with the Triumph Hurdle and the Stayers Hurdle. Yeah, uh, the Stayers Hurdle was... Um, I rode a horse called Lighter, who was trained by John Edwards, who was, who was... I was... In those days, I rode for two main stables. My two main stables were Stan Meller, who was my number one stable and John Edwards was my other stable I rode for mainly and Slyter was a lovely horse who'd won the I think he'd won the Eber handicap on the flat and uh, he was still a colt and he was one of these lovely horses with, that you could sort of play jockeys with and sit out the back and then come with a devastating run at the end and that was a, that was a, that was the theory anyway and anyway he he, he won the stairs hurdle and uh that was a good day. And then um, the following day, I was riding Pollardstown for Stan in the Triumph. And we had this feeling that he didn't go on soft ground. And um, it was, it was de- terrible weather that year. It was very soft. And uh, we, Stan and I walked the course beforehand. And, it, and we discussed it. And anyway, he decided, he decided the horse was going to run. Well, he was sort of touch and go. He said, I think I might pull him out. And anyway... He, he decided to take his chance. And um, by the time he came past the stands the first time, after we jumped two, I knew he'd made the right decision. This, the horse was really acting in the ground. We'd never really run him in soft, but we thought he wouldn't go on it. But we, he was acting in, in, on, on, on the, that sort of soft ground. And we had a wonderful run around the inside. And uh, it was a race I always remember. He was a, he was a fantastic horse, Pollardstown. He was second in the champion hurdle. Uh, very unlucky. I mean, I don't know if you're going to bring this come up, bring this up, but uh, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about it now if you like. He was second in the champion hurdle to to uh, Sea Pigeon, ridden probably the most brilliant ride by John Frankham, and he did uh, ride brilliantly most of the time. But this was the most brilliant. Uh, came to the last. We were what two lengths upsides a horse called Daring Run. And uh, we daring run came to us. We were turning. We were in front, turning for home. Daring run came to us, and then we fought him off. And I thought we'd got the race won. And on the line, Sea Pigeon swept past us and uh, and won. But I think I think we we were a bit unlucky because Polistan was two miles was really his minimum distance. He could have he could have 
you know, if he'd run over two and a half or three, he was good enough to win a champion hurdle at two, but, you know, really he was a two and a half mile or three mile horse. And the year we ran, the years we ran in it, they shortened the track. In the, old, the, the track before then, they used to go up past the stands and then round and, and finish. Um, and uh, they changed the course so that it, you turned in front of the stands, so you didn't have to go up the hill twice. And... Um, they, they so it not only made the t- course easier because you didn't have to tackle the hill twice, but it also shortened the race by a couple of hundred yards, which I think made the difference to us. If he'd if he'd had the old run on the old track, we we possibly could have won it, but we were second anyway. Well, thank you for all of that. You you filled in quite a few gaps for me there. Um, the uh, uh, John Frankham fabulous finish, leaving um, his run on Sea Pigeon until the last minute. And Pollardstown was also fourth and fifth in a champion hurdle that you rode him on. So uh, he never he never looked like winning again. I mean that was that that was the one chance we had when when Sea Pigeon beat him. And certainly the uh triumph hurdle of the success uh watching that um back on YouTube was a cavalry charge compared to last week's I think eight runners I think in the triumph hurdle. Wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, in those days, you used to have well twenty six runners in the cha- in the triumph. Um, so uh, things have changed a bit. And just going back to your career as a jockey, what what was it like um, as a jockey in the nineteen seventies? With your, you know, yourself with, did you have weight issues and that sort of thing? And was it really hard work? I always had weight problems. Yeah, uh, it was probably the reason why I finished when I did. That and the fact that I knew what I was wanting to do, in, you know, for another career. But uh, I always had weight problems. I spent my life in the sauna bath. Uh, I used to get up at uh, any morning. I'd get up at five in the morning, turn the sauna bath on, go back to bed for half an hour, and then jump in the sauna and um, lose a few pounds. It was always a, a nightmare for me until. I think with the year I retired, which was I, was, I was sitting in the sauna with Bill Smith, a uh, Queen Mother's jockey, and uh, we were sitting in the sauna at Liverpool uh, for the Aintree meeting, and um, I said to him, I, I don't think I can take this anymore. I cannot, I cannot sit in another bloody sauna bar. And um, so that was that. I packed in at the end of that year. Um, but uh, I always had... I was... Uh, um, had had weight problems because I was, you know, I'm five foot ten, and um, the other thing was we weren't very good with our diet in those days. You know, we used to, there was no racing on Sunday, so you'd sort of get stuck in on the Sunday lunch and then worry. <laughs> 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 so Monday come Monday morning, you think, God, I got to do ten two today, and so um, you jump in the sauna, but which wasn't terribly healthy way of losing weight, but. Uh, uh, and I'm sure they do it better now. They've got dietitians and goodness knows what. So they, they've got a lot. <laughs> they, it's a, they, they've got it under control better now. But luckily, from what you were saying, you knew what to do as soon as you retired. Yeah, I was, I was very lucky in that uh, for some reason I'd always, always had a, a, an interest in sculpture. And, uh, and I've, you know, well, I'd, I think it came from looking at trophies and thinking, I wonder, I wonder how they made that, you know. And anyway, as luck would have it, in the 70s, there was, there was a petrol crisis uh, in, the, in the sort of mid, mid-70s when um, everyone was trying to save petrol. I think, I think the, the general idea was that the world was going to run out of fuel. And anyway, so everyone was trying to save, save money. By or save petrol, and so I was booked to ride some horses down at Devon and Exeter, and the trainer and I uh, drove down. And unusually, we picked the the, the owner up on the way down, uh, which wouldn't normally happen. But anyway, she turned out to be a sculptor, and we got talking. And I said, I've always had this interest, and she said, Well, look, come stay when when. Uh, racing's over in the summer because in those days they didn't have any racing in the summer and um come and stay and we'll 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 see what you you know you can have a go at it so that's what i did and um i had this i just got fascinated by it and 
I had found that I had a, a sort of a bit of a talent for it. And at the time I was thinking, what on earth am I going to do when I, when I pack in riding? I had no idea because I, I didn't really want fancy training very much. And um, anyway, so I was, I was talking to Margo and I, I remember I didn't even know you could make a living out of it. And uh, out of sculpture, I remember saying to her, do you, I mean, could, do people make a living out of this? And she said, oh, yes, of course they do. You know, there are people that do. And anyway, so uh, for the next five or six years, which is when I was writing for Stan Meller, uh, I was sort of preparing for when I packed in, I was going to be a sculptor. And um, so that's how it worked out. Uh, luckily, I uh, I packed in and got a, got a good gallery in London to represent me and... Um, so that was that. And was one of your first works the Grand National Trophy of 1986? Yeah, well, it, it, yeah, I'd, it would have been an early work. By then, I'd sort of made a bit of a, a little bit of a name because I'd had an exhibition. I, what I, I arranged to do was that I, I was fully aware of the fact I was an ex-jockey uh, turning to sculpture was an unusual uh, thing to do and it was sort of newsworthy and I thought well I, I'll, I'm going to make use of this mm. and so when I packed in riding I um, had all these friends press men who I'd been friends with for years since I was you know doing my riding career and, and they all very kindly wrote up about this exhibition which I had about a year after I packed in that was in London at the Tryon Gallery and um and so that promotion really launched me and uh, I sold a, a, a fantastic amount of sculpture. Um, just a, it was just phenomenal. Anyway, so that, that got me noticed. Uh, and then um, the, the managing director of Seagram's called Ivan Straker got hold of me and said, look, we, we, we need a, a new trophy for the Grand National. And... At the same time, he said, I don't know if you're going to bring this up, but he, he said, and, and also what we really want is a life-size statue of red rum. And, uh, well, I said, you know, my biggest ambition in life is to do a life-size sculpture of a horse. And red rum would be a dream come true. And so that's how it came out. And, there, and Seagram then commissioned me to do this statue at Red Rum, which stands at Aintree now. And it was a wonderful uh, experience because I didn't know Ginger McCain, um, but I got to know him quite well because I went up to Southport and saw the horse. And and so it became um, a wonderful experience because I remember seeing him on, the, on, the, on, on Southport Sands and watching him sort of being ridden out at home. And um, it was my first life size, so I was a very inexperienced, but it worked out very well. Yes, well, I've seen the, uh, I've been to the Grand National myself on nearly 10 occasions, so I've seen the, the Red Rum statue. How did you capture all his different characteristics? Well, that was because I, I saw him uh, on the sands at Southport, and he, he just, um, the minute he touched the sand, he started jig jogging and sort of ducking and diving sideways, and 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 I just thought, what a wonderful picture of the horse! You know, I didn't I didn't want to do the sort of conventional standing portrait. I wanted to capture his spirit, and he had this very high head carriage, and uh, when he was sort of not when he was racing, but uh, when he was on the sands, he held, held his head very high, and he was jig jogging. I wanted to, to capture that moment rather because um, he wasn't going to have a jockey on, so it wasn't going to be as though he was at the races. He, you know, it's going to, I wanted to catch that moment when he gets onto the sands, which, is, which he'd sort of made his own, hadn't he? Southport Sands was identified with red rum. And did you get uh, Ginger McCain's approval as well? Absolutely. Ginger was fantastic. He was really helpful. And he, you know, he when when uh, it was finished, he he was very pleased, and he sent me this letter with uh, a shoe of, from Red Rum, and he said, uh, "I just wanted to send you this. 
in appreciation of your when I saw your statue of the the great horse at Aintree, and I just wanted to send you this as a memento, which I have hanging up here with the letter, and so I was rather touched by that. Yeah, for someone who featured in two of his most iconic uh, victories in 1973 and 77. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it was it was extraordinary, you know, the, the, the fact that uh, the first time I saw him properly was as we headed down towards Beaches, and there I looked across, and there was Red Rum with Brian Fletcher. And little did I know a few years later I'd be... Um, making a, a, a life-size statue of him. We're talking of life-sized statues. You've also done many others, um, just a feature of food, Best Mate at Cheltenham, uh, Desert Orchid at Kempton, uh, Persian Punch at Newmarket Races, uh, Maccabi Diva at uh, Flemington, and uh, Northern Dancer at Woodbine. When you do a full-size one, um, I read that you start by doing a 16th size to start with. Is that right? Um, yeah, it's not 16th, actually. It's, it's not as small as that. It's, um, it's about one sixth size. And the idea of that is to sort of, uh, for one thing, you make it so that the client can see it. And so he knows what you, what he's getting, you know, so you can show it to him and say, look, this is what you're going to get. And it's going to be six times bigger. And, um, so they can then make any comments and, ask you to change things if if they needed changing and also the other idea is it, it sort of irons out any problems you might have and when you're doing a life size there's a lot of welding um, involved and you have to weld a, fra- weld a frame in steel which and the idea of that is to uh, to support the clay which is going to go on afterwards which uh, and the clay there is a clay is very heavy, and you ha- there is at least a ton of clay that goes on, so it has to be a very robust frame. But what that means is that you you don't want to make mistakes. So uh, when you the idea of making the scale model, the one sixth model, is that you iron out any mistakes, like because you've got a wire frame, you can bend it and and work out exactly, take measurements from it, and work out exactly what you're going to do on the larger scale. And so you you get that spot on, and then it's just a matter of mathematically scaling up your model. But I mean, since I'm the worst mathematician in the world, I, ma- I simplify it by having a base with a, a ground clan on it. And consequently... Um, all the measurements are related to this ground plan on the which I, which I mark in pencil on the on the base but uh, so but the whole thing is is it, it, once you start on the life size you have to know exactly what you're going to do because there is no room for error you, and to ha- if you have to change it then it's a major uh, operation and it's not funny presumably the success of the red rum uh, sculpture led you to these next horses that you then did life-size ones as well yeah i was really lucky because um after red rum i did for lady tavistock um she had this famous mayor called mrs moss who founded a, a dynasty really of good horses and she wanted us she wanted a statue to go outside woburn abbey and um, the house at Woburn, rather. And uh, I did that for her. And when that was over, she said, I'm so delighted with this. I want to, I want to do something for you. And I, want, and, and I said, and I said oh, OK. Yeah. And she said, what would you like to do next? And I said, well, I don't know. I thought about it for a bit. And, and she said, well, just what, what, you know, think of a project you'd like to do. And I said, well, I suppose, if I'm honest, I would like to do a sculpture, a statue, a life-size statue, of the world's most famous stallion, Northern Dancer. Uh, anyway, a few weeks later, the phone rings, and it's Henrietta Tavistock saying, I've got you the job doing Northern Dancer. 
And um, so I flew over to Woodbine, saw uh, uh, Charles Taylor, who, who owned uh, Northern Dancer. Well, Northern Dancer was dead by then, so I had to work from photographs and, um, and measurements. Uh, and anyway, I met, I'm, uh, and uh, so that's how that came about, and that now stands at, at Woodbine in, in, in Toronto. Yeah, I thought uh, when I saw that you'd done um, Northern Dance that he, would have, he wouldn't have been alive, whereas some of the other horses you must have uh, done life-size um, were, were still alive. Yeah, uh, Generous, I, is at Epsom, he was still alive. Um, in fact, Did you get to see them, Desi? You must have seen Desi. Yeah, he was. Um, yeah. Desi was a bit controversial because when I saw him, I promise you, he just won his uh, a gold cup, and he looked as thin as a rake. I mean, he just looked. He looked so fit, you wouldn't believe it. I mean, and and everybody had this idea that Desi was the most beautiful grey horse that's ever been. I'm not saying he wasn't beautiful, but he was pretty raw-boned and he was pretty sort of, uh, you know, sort of a, a real old-fashioned chaser type and sort of raw-looking. And particularly when I saw him, he just looked absolutely, you know, fit as you could possibly imagine. And, and I that's how I portrayed him. A lot of people didn't like that. Um... Uh, some people said I, I uh, made him look as though he had worms. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I look at it, I, I think it stood the test of time. And I look, when I look at it now, although they painted it white, for, <laughs> I mean, I did, and I can understand why, but we used to patinate it, which is a, a application of uh, acid. You put applica- uh, to colour the thing, and we made it white. But they've since then... Um, painted it white which uh, I think looks a bit well a bit garish uh, to say the least and um, anyway a lot of people didn't like that because I've made him look a bit thin but I think it stands the test of time when I when I have seen it I thought well it looks all right uh, yeah I mean that's red that is uh, desert orchid and you've moved into other areas you've and boxers you you also paint as well yeah i'm uh i love painting um but uh i came to painting rather late um and my great friend peter curling who's an who's a really good painter who's a proper painter he's um he's he gives me advice and i've been on holiday with him on a painting holiday with him in france and he's excellent he's excellent at giving advice but anyway, that's it. <clears throat> and also, I do sculpt other things. Uh, I've did, a, yeah, as you say, I did a boxer which is in Cardiff Bay. J- uh, Jim Driscoll, I think he was called. Yeah, um, a flyweight. Was he a flyweight? Yeah. And um, I've done a strong man in Blythe, and I've just finished doing three opera singers. Um, not big ones, but small ones which i hope i'm going to scale up into life size or nearly life size and i did that and that came about because my wife's an opera singer and um, i was sitting in here thinking what am i going to do next and she was playing the piano next door and singing and i thought hmm maybe opera singers <laughs> so, <laughs> so i've done maria callas and you like the challenge of doing something different than a horse then yeah yeah, I love it. I love it actually. And, and last year, I I did a, a life size uh, nude for somebody's garden, nude lady, which um, was uh, went very well. So I like, you know, I like the I love the horses, but um, I like to do other things as well, and painting and drawing, and you know, what is great about painting and drawings is that you just you can just sort of get a bit of paper out and scribble away and. Sometimes it works out, sometimes it doesn't. The thing about sculpture, or certainly things being cast in bronze, is that bronze casting is so expensive that you've got to be pretty sure that there's a market for it. So anything anything that's less than totally satisfactory doesn't see the light of day because it's just not worth casting. 
Well, you're obviously keeping very busy. Uh, how does working as a sculptor compare to riding in the Grand National? Uh, well, it doesn't in that um, they obviously they're totally different. But, you know, the thing is that I do look back on my riding career as one of the most exciting things. I mean, it, 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 the sculpture is great. I mean, I love it. And it's a, it, it, it is a, a, a wonderful way to, to make a living uh, because it's sort of satisfying and, uh, you know, you know when you've done a good job and all. But for sheer, I mean, excitement, you know, you can't. There is no comparison with being a jockey. You know, it's the most exciting. It is the most exciting uh, uh, profession you could possibly have. And the only thing I slightly regret is I don't think being as young, being young, you quite appreciate it. And it's only when you get older and you look back and you think, gosh, that was something amazing. You know, it was the most amazing time. And, uh, you know, to, to, to ride at Cheltenham Festival and not only ride the Cheltenham but ride winners at the Cheltenham Festival and ride in the National you know people people would pay thousands of pounds to ride good horses round Aintree and I was getting paid to do it which to my mind was a dream and so for sheer excitement you couldn't beat the racing but as a, as a as for satisfaction job satisfaction the sculpture is wonderful well, thank you for that. And I, I triggered something in your memory today to say it's 50 years since you rode at Aintree. So, and one final question, which I've asked a few guests recently, hopefully on June the 21st, we're expecting to return to some form of normal. Is the one thing you'd like to do on June the 21st that you haven't been able to do? Um... Do you know, I'd, I'd, I just would love to go to a good restaurant, <laughs> uh, if I'm perfectly honest. Do you know, I, I don't, I don't, I'm not a great pub goer, but I do like eating out and I'd love to go to a really good restaurant. And, um, last, you know, I had last year, or oh, well, just before the lockdown, I had, I had a hip replaced and we went, the night before I had my hip replaced, my wife and I went to this Chinese in London called Hunan and it was just the best Chinese I've ever eaten in my life and I think and I thought you know even it was you know I had it was going to have a hip operation the next day but it even took my mind off that and I'd like to go back to Hunan to be honest <laughs> that's that would be my dream well that's something to look forward to thank you very much for being on the paddock and the pavilion and sharing your two careers with us this morning Hang on a sec. Can I just uh, one other one other thing I really want to do more than anything, probably more than going to the Chinese. I just want to. My son is a trainer in California, and he's just had his first Group One winner, and he has this horse is going to run in the Breeders' Cup in at Del Mar in California, and that is what I want to do more than anything else. Wow, well, we'll go and actually yeah. go, go there and watch it. Yeah, to go there and watch it. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that'll be that'll be fantastic. I hope so. Yeah. That's the plan anyway. Well, thank you again, Philip. Thank you. I enjoyed it. Thank you for listening to The Paddock and the Pavilion. You can download the show on Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud, Stitcher and Spotify. Follow us on Twitter and Facebook at The Pad and Pad. Sports Social Podcast Network. Taking charge of your future starts with taking the first steps. And saving up to $30 a month on Cox Internet with the Affordable Connectivity Program makes those steps easy to take. Whether they bring you to click upload on your first short film or join now for an online book club. Applying is easy. See if you qualify at cox.com slash ACP. Non-transferable one per household application and eligibility decisions are made by the FCC.